I show that because it reminds me so much of my first date with my wife. <laughs> Horseback ride, speaking French, just I think we're all like that. Genesis 2, verse 18, right at the beginning of the Bible, the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought, it to the, uh, brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not a helper found suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is at last, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. Now, jump all the way to the New Testament. The Apostle Paul uh, teaches us about Christian marriage. Ephesians chapter 5, he says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. No, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cher cherishes it, just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Therefore, quoting from Genesis chapter 2, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I am, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, this is what I'm calling here the fight for marriage. The fight for marriage. Way back in 1977, I was in college, had a roommate. Uh, at this particular time, both of us had recently gone through uh, painful, humiliating breakups with, um, with girlfriends. About two in the morning one night, as we were falling asleep, I'm in my loft uh, bunk, and he's down in his bed uh, on the floor level. About two in the morning, he says out loud to me, knowing I was still awake, he says, my nickname in high school college was Roro. My middle name was Roland. Long story. He says, hey, Roro. I said, what? He goes, God really messed up. I was surprised because I'd never heard him talk about God before. So I said, uh, how's that? He said, God messed up when he made two sexes. I went, uh, and I started to get nervous. <laughs> then he said, God messed up because he knows, everybody knows, that guys get along with guys great. We got buddies here. We have fun together. We get, guys get along great with other guys. Everybody knows that girls don't get along with other girls. They fight. They, they cat fight. They have drama all the time. And everybody knows when guys and girls get together, it just ends up like this. Somebody gets hurt. So God really messed up. I'm just listening. He says, what he should have done was just make men, one sex, and now when we reached a certain age, we just butted off another human being. God's God. He could have done that, right? So we had this interesting theological discussion about creation at 2 in the morning. And today, in our culture, there's a great debate, a great cultural debate and confusion about marriage. The Bible here, from Genesis all the way to the New Testament, defines marriage as one man and one woman joined together in a covenant for life. That's the definition. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, be hold fast to his wife, or be united to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife are both naked and were not ashamed. That's the statement. It's made in the Old Testament. It's made in the New Testament. It's uh, restated by Jesus himself. We're not free to redefine that definition. The Bible is very clear. This is God's design. That's how human sexuality was designed. Someone said it's so obvious that I had to go to grad school to unlearn it, right? It's so obvious how God designed human beings. And every expression of sexuality outside of that definition is ultimately destructive according to the Bible. Now, so what about what's going on today? What about gay marriage? What about the LGTB community? Let me say just a few things about this. I can't cover it all today, but let me just say this. As a follower of Christ, I believe I'm called to love others. Those like me, those unlike me, even those who hate me because that's how God loves. That, that's baseline, called to love. I'm also called to truth. I'm called to fight for the truth of God's word. Therefore, 
I don't believe I can endorse the marriage of a man to a man or a woman to a woman any more than I can endorse the marriage of a man to three women or a woman to more than one man. Now, I don't understand where same-sex attraction comes from. Nobody can explain that to you or to me. It's a mystery. I did not consciously choose my own sexual orientation. I don't remember choosing that. It's just the way I am. Those, who I, those I've talked to who experience same-sex attraction don't know where it comes from either. They feel like they were born that way. I can't explain that. But it's not my job to judge those who feel same-sex attraction. It's not my job. It's my calling to love them and understand them with great compassion. For example, those who identify themselves as gay or experience same-sex attraction are welcome at our church. We have those who are coming now, some who are quiet, some who we don't even know about. I hope they'd be loved, accepted, welcomed in every aspect of church life, but they're going to hear us teach the truth and talk about the truth. It's both. It's love, acceptance, and it's truth. does not mean I'm obligated to change the definition of marriage. There's a lot more we could talk about here. When I have the time, I will. Legal ramifications, the possibility of civil unions, the option of celibacy, which our culture has largely forgotten as an option in terms of sexuality. Uh, Rick Warren, a pastor in California, has uh, uh, one of the most important uh, things to say about this, I think, that we need to pay attention to. He says, two of the greatest lies that our culture believes today are, first, if you love someone, you have to agree with them. And if you disagree with someone, you have to hate them. Both those are false. We need to pay attention to that. Both of those are false. You can love someone and disagree with them at the same time. Jesus said we can love our enemies. We can love those who don't uh, think like we do, who don't live like we do. Now, I must also say that, in my opinion, the way that those of us who have identified ourselves as Bible-believing Christians have sometimes dealt with this is issue leaves a great deal to be desired. For example, for years, uh, one of the leading voices uh, that I, you can see on the Internet, he passed away fairly recently, and I forget the name of his church, was this Baptist preacher. He's always a Baptist preacher, right? Baptist preacher out in Kansas or whatever, big beard. He would hold signs up that says, God hates. I can't even say the word out loud that he would put on the signs. So the world out there thinks that's what I think, that's what we think, and it's not. It's not what we're taught. It's not what the Bible teaches. Uh, we have a great challenge to articulate both the grace of Christ and the truth of God's Word at the same time. And it's a huge challenge for us in today's world. So marriage, human sexuality, was God's idea, God's intent, God's design. So therefore, it's good. Interestingly, even secular research today shows that God's design is good. Um, research shows that the most sexually satisfied people in America are not young, single people living the dream, they're not young, single people living uh, a relatively promiscuous, sexually liberated lifestyle. Research shows that the most sexually satisfied people in America are monogamous, long-term married couples. Cuts against what we think, uh, what the media tells us. Cuts against what the movies are telling us. Cuts against what TV is telling us. But that's what the research shows. I found this quote from a study. Cross-tabulations by religious denomination show those that with no affiliation, that is no involvement with religious activities, are least likely to report being extremely satisfied with their sex lives, either physically or emotionally. Furthermore, findings were that emotional satisfaction and physical pleasure related to sex are higher for frequent attenders of religious services. Boom. There you go. <laughs> Along similar lines, a report says that couples who pray together have more ecstasy in their sex lives. Double boom, right? So my roommate was wrong. God didn't mess up. People mess up. God didn't mess up. Uh, we are to fight for marriage, God's design for marriage. Secondly, we're also in a, uh, to fight for a woman. Uh, right there in the beginning of the Bible, God gives Adam a woman, and he wants her to, him to fight for this woman. Now, what's that mean? In Braveheart, if you recall the movie, uh, William Wallace pursues his love, and this, this is the movie version. I don't know in the historical version how all this went. He wins her heart, and then quite literally has to fight for her it's a tragic opening to the movie. Remember, the whole movie begins with the British uh, practice of raping Scottish brides on their wedding night before the husband can come into her, okay? And so Wallace is fighting that. He, he hides his wife. Eventually, they get her. She resists. They kill her. So he goes on this rampage, and that's how the, kind of the revolutionary revolution starts. Now, most of us who are married uh, have pursuit stories. You know, we're kind of designed to pursue 
the, the, the object of our attraction. Uh, I once in our dating life, um, I think before we were engaged, I once drove 22 hours driving from Chicago to Orlando, Florida, stopping only for gas just to surprise her one time. You know, driven entirely by hormones. You know, I did that once, 22 hours without ever stopping, except for gas. I think I stopped twice. Now, sometimes I won't even stop to pick up my socks, right? What changes? We go from pursuit to being relatively lazy. But I'm called as a husband to fight for my wife, for my marriage, whatever that takes. What does it mean to fight for a woman? What does it mean to fight for your marriage? Paul says, I'm going to take this in three bites here. Paul says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Gave himself up for her. Uh, my brother tells a story, and I probably told it here at Team a couple years ago, where early in their marriage, they were in their early 20s, I think she might have even been expecting their first child, which makes the story even better. Uh, they had a little starter home in Orlando, Florida, taking a walk in the evening, just he and his bride married just maybe a year, year and a half, and they're walking along, and just in love, you know, holding hands. And suddenly, to his surprise, out of nowhere, uh, a, a giant uh, Doberman pincher, comes leaping around from behind a bush, you know, barking. It looks like he's going to eat them both alive. My brother said before he could even think about it, he leaped behind his wife <laughs> like a human shield. Big dog, big dog, big dog, like that. It took him years, he said, to, to, to live down what he did there. Wasn't exactly giving himself up for her. Uh, what does it mean that Jesus gave himself up for her, the church? Well, first of all, we need to see this is a revolutionary thought in that culture. Revolutionary thought. Women at that time were seen more or less as property of men. In ancient Roman or Greek culture, men often had their wives to bear their children, but they had their mistresses or prostitutes for their pleasure. It's commonly accepted practice. But then Christianity explodes in the ancient world, teaches that women are created in the image of God and wives are to be loved sacrificially by their husbands. Revolutionary idea. Turn the world upside down with regard to understanding between the sexes. Sacrifice. What does it mean? Well, to me it means that my happiness and fulfillment are found in my wife's happiness and fulfillment. My happiness and fulfillment are found, if I believe this, in my wife's happiness and fulfillment. I am called to give myself up for her. Give my life, if that's what it takes. Now, let me also pause here and say the Bible also gives specific instruction to wives. It says, wives, respect your husbands. Respect. Respect. Follow their leadership. Trust their leadership. Respect. But I'm not talking to wives today. I'm talking to husbands. I'm talking to men. Okay? What creates respect in a wife? Give your life for her protection. Give your life for her well-being. Every woman wants to be loved like that. Next, he says, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. What's going on there? That we might, uh, that, that the husband is to help make his wife Holy. Now, there's all kinds of things going on here. Paul is comparing the marriage relationship to the relationship of Christ and the church. Jesus makes the church holy through his sacrifice for sin. We understand that. That's what the cross is about. Now, how do we do that for our wives? Obviously, we can't do it the way Jesus did it. He already died for our sins. We don't do that. But I think Paul is suggesting that the way we love and treat our wives should make them more of what God created them to be, not less. Okay? Splendor. Look at the language. Splendor without spot or wrinkle. I can make a joke there, but I'm going to avoid that. Some scholars think that means to relieve our wives of stress and fear, that their faces become smooth without wrinkle or stress. Radiant, one translation says. I think also one of the functions of a healthy marriage is this word sanctification. Sanctification is an old-fashioned word that means to be made holy, being made holy. See, marriage, I believe, reveals our selfishness and sin. If you've been married for any, long time, any length of time, you know that that's true. Marriage reveals how selfish we can be. And there's conflict in marriage. But in a healthy marriage, that conflict, as a husband and wife are both submitted to Christ, helps us become more holy. It's a crucible for sanctification. Resolve conflict through confession, repentance, and forgiveness, and you help one another become 
more holy, one of the functions of marriage. And Paul talks about that here in Ephesians. Thirdly, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. Nourish and cherish. I uh, uh, listen uh, as I drive around uh, from one place to another to uh, a a sports talk show quite often. And there's been a commercial being played recently, and I I couldn't find the exact language of it and couldn't hear it yesterday when I really needed it, but it goes something like this. It's a radio ad, and the voice says, it's a man's voice, he says, she's been with you all these years. She holds your hand when you walk with her, and she's always ready to go when you turn her on. And then you realize he's talking about a lawnmower. (laughs) Talking about proper care for a lawnmower, using the right oil, tune-ups and all that sort of stuff. Comparing, you know, they're tricking you into thinking that way. And part of me is going, man, that'd be a lot easier if it was like a lawnmower, right? (laughs) Put it in the garage, put oil in it, rev it up, it's ready to go. You know, it'd be a lot easier. (laughs) Nourishing and cherishing is hard work. It's hard. It means to provide and protect, which is the easy part of marriage, provide and protect. I can do that. Nourishing and cherishing, that means stuff like listening, caring, using those three words, tell me more. (laughs) Right? Am I right? Hmm? Try those three words this weekend sometime. She'll love it, but be be prepared. Have some time. Right? (laughs) There's a lot of confusion out there about marriage. There is. There are a lot of confused men. There are a lot of confused young men. I got four in my house that I want to know what it takes to be a man. What does it mean to be a warrior? What does it mean to fight for a marriage? What does it mean to fight for a woman? Do they know what it means? Or is it like a lawnmower sitting in your garage? Do they know? The Bible teaches us that a warrior pursues a woman. Pursues. With everything you got, you pursue. A warrior protects with his very life if necessary. And a warrior nourishes. Nourishes a woman's heart. So, the first warrior, Adam, is called to, be a, to fight for God's word for truth. It's my, this is my command to you. He gave it to Adam. You can eat from every tree, but not that one. And then he gives him a woman, and he wants him to fight for this woman, to be united to her, to be one flesh with her, to be naked and not ashamed. One woman, one man, covenant for life. Next week, we start to find out. If you want to read ahead in your booklet, read ahead. We're going to find out how Adam did with his first two charges, with the first two jobs God gave him to do. We're going to find out how Adam did. Here's the questions I want you to start dealing with. I'm going to add one today, so leaders, pay attention. You can write down the third one. First one is just for fun. Tell the story of your very first crush on a girl. Can you remember? What was her name? How old were you? And what do you remember about that, that, that very first crush? What do you remember? Secondly, if you're married... What's the craziest thing you did in pursuit of the woman who eventually became your wife? I told you one of the things I did. I did a few other things too. What's the craziest thing you did when you were were hot in pursuit? Thirdly, here's the new one. Here's the one I want you to get to if you can. If you are married, and if you're not, you're listening in. You can talk about if you have a a significant relationship, whatever. I know there are guys here who once were married and are, 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 are not right now. But if you are married, what could you do in the next week? Make it very specific. In the next week. To fight for your marriage, to pursue, to protect, to listen. What could you do in the next week as a warrior to fight for your marriage? Okay, there's extra coffee, extra donuts. I'll wrap you up about five minutes before 7 o'clock.